Republicans inside the state capitol reverse course to support police reform. When I first saw the bill, and when, as it was introduced, I thought it was uh, a punishment, revenge bill against law enforcement. Maybe they heard footsteps, weeks worth of footsteps. Defunding police, that is the protest cry. Let's look at what it practically means. Coloradans will vote on abortion restrictions, again. People died trying to find his hidden treasure somewhere in the West. He says it's been found. I'm not sure what to believe. And while I'm not the brightest bulb, some of the new signs downtown are. A next viewer wonders why we're allowed to be blinded by the light. Next. We are witnessing something really interesting at the state capitol these days. Republicans are coming around to the idea of police reform just days after they called the Democrats' bill revenge on law enforcement. That includes former Weld County Sheriff Senator John Cook. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger spoke with Cook today shortly after he came out in support of the sweeping police reforms that Marshall Hughes opposed to, what, just like a day, two ago? Yeah, over the weekend, he said if I had asked him even on Saturday if he was a, a, going to be a vote yesing, a vote yes for this bill, he told me not a chance. But over the weekend, he was talking with the Democrats who were really supportive of this, that didn't need a Republican vote. They talked about the issues that law enforcement community members had, and they came to a resolution, which is rare here that we see at the legislature when it comes to very contentious issues. But his vote today, along with Senator Bob Gardner from Colorado Springs, that's just one vote. There's going to be another vote that's necessary tomorrow before it even gets out of the Senate and then moves over to the House where it's going to go through the entire process all over again. Uh, this bill makes multiple changes to every law enforcement department. It will require body cameras on all officers, deputies or troopers when they're interacting with the public. The body camera footage would have to be released to the public within two weeks with specific exceptions when someone dies or there's nudity or perhaps a rape victim who's caught on camera. There's an added quote duty to intervene meaning an officer is required to step in if they see another officer violating policies or the law. There are use of force changes which some departments are already doing including no chokeholds and it creates officer liability. Now the original bill put an officer personally on the hook for a lawsuit up to $100,000 and that's one one section Republican Senator John Cook was against and wanted to change. They're not totally protected. The, um, if they operate outside the bounds of the like, policies of procedure or act uh, inappropriately, the city can say we're not going to indemnify and they're on the hook for the 25000 but they can use insurance to pay for it. In the original bill, they weren't allowed to, do, uh, to use insurance. Every time they brought something up, it made sense to include state patrol. It made sense to have more clarity around what is excessive force and protecting victims and witnesses as it relates to body cam. You know, this is what the process is supposed to include, where you have the committee hearings, where you have a bill that's written in a week and you realize you've probably written it so fast. Think of a term paper that you have to edit over time that when you get together with the people who live this, like a John Cook, who was a county sheriff, you come to that compromise that both sides can agree. Yeah, we need to make some changes. We're going to be on the right side of this. So let's come together and make these changes. Mm -hmm. Marshall, it seems looking at it from just purely a practical standpoint, because the, de because the Democrats don't need a single Republican vote, if the Republicans were to just sit there and criticize the thing, then there'd be no incentive for the Democrats to change it by voting yes on some procedural votes or by indicating that they could be a potential yes. That kind of dangles the carrot for maybe for them to get a few things that they might they might want. Sure. And it comes to the point that I asked Senator Cook about, do you want to be on the right side of this? What, what, what do you think the right side of this situation is with all the protesting going on? Do you want to be seen as someone saying, no, we're good the way things are? And he said, that's the mentality. Like we saw things that could be changed. We just needed to tweak it to make sure it fit with what's possible. People ask, what do the protests accomplish? Boom. There, Marshall, thank you. I want to talk about one of the changes that's been made to this bill. It was an issue that was brought up by law enforcement, also by a number of Next viewers. It was the portion that said that officers' interactions with citizens must be recorded and then released to the public within 14 days. 
The concern is how that might impact victims of crime, including sexual assault victims. Larimer County's Republican Sheriff Justin Smith, vocal critic of that bill, he's been on this program, he talked about this over the weekend on social media. He claimed that sexual assault victims' interviews with detectives had to be released unedited to anybody who wanted to view them within two weeks. That is one of the issues that has been addressed as this bill moves very quickly through the legislature. There's an amended version that deals with that specific provision. The bill now says that unedited video, body cam video, should be released within 14 days for, quote, incidents where there's an allegation of police misconduct. So not everything. All video and audio recordings of a death must be given to the deceased person's family at least 24 hours before public release. If the body cam video shows any nudity or highly personal information, the victim will have input on what should be redacted. Defund the police. That's the slogan on some protest signs. And you'll hear plenty of scaremongering about how police departments would go away overnight. There'd be nobody to call for help in a crisis. When many activists call for defunding the police, what they're talking about is reallocating some of the law enforcement funding and some of their responsibility. It's all about the details here. Our Steve Steger takes a closer look. I get concerned when I see kind of the paramilitary sort of thing. Denver and, District 11 um, Councilwoman Stacy Gilmore has joined with all members of City Council asking that the actions of police during protests last week get an outside look. But those images coupled with a call from protesters to defund police also have her thinking about the police department's budget. We need to see significant changes in the Denver Police Department's budget and how we're going to reinvest back into our neighborhood. Gilmore and several other members of City Council want to see some reallocation of the quarter of a billion dollars Denver invests in its police department each year, giving some of it instead to social services. What they're not talking about is we won't have any detectives and murders will go unsolved. CU criminal law professor Aya Gruber says it's a conversation going on across the country about taking some things off of officers' plates, like investing in mental health professionals to deal with someone in crisis. If all you have is that brute force and you tell the police, this is how you manage dysfunction in society, you give them that hammer, Everything and everybody is going to look like a nail. But you can't have uh, a, a caseworker from social services respond to a person with a gun, right? MSU Denver criminal justice professor and former officer Kevin Smith says that's unrealistic. I think police officers, you know, by their trade, by their profession, have to be kind of the triage unit to respond to those needs. He says any talk about reallocating funds to reform police should be a discussion about training and recruiting. All agree something has to change. After what has been the biggest and most sustained and most national protest in U.S. history, I think if we don't see major changes, people are going to be very disappointed and they're going to really lose faith in their governing officials. So I mentioned that Denver City Council wants an outside investigation into the protests that uh, in the action of Denver police officers during those protests. They would like the city's independent monitor to take a look at that. And Kyle, every member of the city council signed on to a letter asking the independent monitor to do that today. See, when I hear the suggestions from some advocates that uh, the idea of mental health responses should be taken away from police, it sounds like what I've heard a lot from law enforcement over the years, that they don't want to be in that position and they know that they're not the best trained to deal with a lot of those situations. Not to mention another thing you hear in this conversation as well is dealing with the homeless population, that there could be social service providers who might better understand how to interact with folks who are going through a situation like that and better work with them than police officers who have to get a whole lot of different training on how to deal with different people. That's the argument that the folks who are saying, maybe we ought to take some of these resources and put them somewhere else. That's their argument. Well, and as former Sheriff Cook is demonstrating at the legislature, people are open to ideas when they have law enforcement minds at the table as well. Steve, thank you for that. Coloradans are going to vote in November on a ban on abortions after 22 weeks. Yes, another vote on abortion in Colorado. Advocates learned today that they have enough signatures to get it on the ballot once more. 
A ban would have an exception for the life and physical health of the mother, but not a mental health exception. The ban does not have criminal penalties for a woman who gets an abortion after 22 weeks, but it would charge the doctor with a misdemeanor and a three-year loss of license. Democratic Senate candidate Andrew Romanoff says that his rival John Hickenlooper's ethics violations jeopardize the chances for Democrats to beat Senator Cory Gardner in November. It is Romanoff's sharpest language yet since Hickenlooper was found to have violated state law twice while in office. Romanoff and Hickenlooper debate here on Nine News right after next tomorrow night. It is the first televised debate of the Democratic Senate primary. I'll moderate tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. on 9 News, streaming on 9news.com and the 9 News app. Four years after the Planned Parenthood shooting in Colorado, it is Planned Parenthood going on trial before the confessed shooter. And the hunt for treasure that costs lives in the West. Now the man who sent him searching says it's been found. Was it? Or was it a hoax from the start? That's next. The shooting in 2015 at a Planned Parenthood clinic in Colorado Springs is leading to a lawsuit against Planned Parenthood. State Supreme Court says that survivors can sue Planned Parenthood for not doing more to prevent that shooting. The alleged shooter, Robert Deere, his murder case has stalled out in state court because of rulings that he's mentally unfit to stand trial. But the lawsuit against Planned Parenthood, brought by Deere's alleged victims, is going to be allowed to move forward. The survivors say because of Deere's history of agitation, that shooting at the Colorado Springs facility was foreseeable and that Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains should have taken steps to prevent it. The case could set precedent for civil liability after mass shootings. We'll take a look at the COVID-19 situation in our state right now. The number of coronavirus patients in the hospitals ticked up. We haven't seen that recently. 229 people up from the daily count of 204 the previous day. 17 people were discharged or transferred in the last day. Avoid the temptation to jump to a conclusion based on one day's data, though. I mean, it, it is the first one-day increase in two weeks. Overall, though, we've seen that number decline on the multi-day average since the end of April. We're going to keep a close eye on it the next week and two, but too early to tell if something's really changing at this point. <laughs> storm system is moving across the state tonight, so that means snow above 9,000 feet, maybe even as low as 7,500 feet for our mountains. Showers and thunderstorms overnight tonight here across the Front Range. Those will start as late as 1 o'clock Tuesday morning, becoming more widespread and lasting through about 7, 8 o'clock. They'll then push out onto the eastern plains and will clear out by Tuesday evening from places like Yuma Ray and Burlington. A high wind warning is in effect for Denver and the Front Range until 6 a.m. Tuesday, 60 mile per hour gusts will be possible as this storm system moves through. It'll also cool us off. 67 degrees, your high tomorrow, will gradually warm up back into the low 90s by the end of the week and the weekend. Today's next question is about bright city lights. Renee asked us about the rules for bright lights and signs downtown. She pointed to the Salesforce signs and new lights on a high rise on Welton. Renee was curious whether they can crank them all the way up to blinding or if there are rules. Renee, we took your question to the city's community planning and development department. City says that signs and lights have to follow code, and that varies by zoning district for the type of zoning. That controls when the signs can be on, their placement, their brightness. And Renee, downtown, where you were wondering about, those bright signs, they can stay on all night long as long as they don't exceed a set brightness level and as long as they don't cause a glare that impacts traffic or homes. You can imagine that could be subjective. So complaints come in via 311, and if the city gets one of those, they'll send an inspector out to see if things are a little too lit in your neighborhood. Years ago, he went searching for Forrest Fenn's supposed treasure. I'm glad they found it, and hopefully someone else will do the same thing and, and just keep the, that spirit of, of, of treasure hunting going. Now, seven years later, our former colleague talks about the claims that that hidden treasure of the West was found. Did it ever exist in the first place? That's next. People have been searching for and dying for Forrest Fenn's hidden treasure for a decade now. The millionaire who specializes in antiquities and seeking attention sent people hunting all over the Rocky Mountain West for it. Now Fenn says the treasure was found. Some believe it never existed in the first place. 
One of the estimated 350,000 people who searched for the treasure is our former Nine News colleague, David Zambrano. Our Byron Reed caught up with David down in Arizona to talk about treasure hunting. Over the past decade, begin it where warm waters halt. Thousands of people went hunting in the dense Rocky Mountains for the treasure hidden by art dealer Forrest Finn. It was a box that was worth about eleven thousand dollars. It had about a million dollars worth of gold coins in it. It had precious stones. David Zambrano was among the many following hints from a poem. He wrote the poem. He said, "If you follow the poem, it will lead lead you to the treasure." Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> Zambrano ended up searching for the hidden 42-pound treasure chest six times. I'm a natural investigator, so I, I have to look, and I have to look at all the places and, and eliminate, process of elimination. Ben says the hunt was a way to tempt people to get into wilderness. And I actually was honing in on an area near the Pecos River in New Mexico. But now it's been reported that the loot has finally been found. I'm glad that somebody found it. I'm curious where they found it. To me, it's, it's, a, it's a modern gold rush tale. Lincoln Davey is an assistant professor of outdoor recreation at MSU Denver and says the hope of finding the more than $1 million treasure chest may have enticed people to get outdoors while others doubted anything was out there. It's not fully clear if this actually was discovered. Um, so I know there are some people uh, who are speculating that maybe this is a, a, a scheme to try to sell some more books. Either way, for the reported 350,000 treasure hunters searching for fortunes, it was more fun to look for it than it was to find it. It's the thrill of the hunt that's the true pot of gold. I'd like to see it happen again. I actually considered it if I ever found the treasure, I thought I would take it back to Forrest Fenn and say, let's hide it again. For next, I'm Byron Reed. In March, it was reported that two men from Colorado, ages 58 and 65, died while they were searching for the treasure on snowmobiles. They are from Deer Trail and Thornton. A Colorado named Randy Billiou died searching for the treasure back in 2016. Today, his ex-wife told us she always thought that the treasure was a hoax. She said that she tried to convince him not to go, but that he needed something to believe in. And now he's gone. You get the final word and feedback each and every day. And that's next. Finish with your feedback. Andrew says, I've grown up with Nine News my entire life, but man, your channel has become the beacon for bleeding heart liberals. It is getting super obnoxious. Andrew asks for another perspective. Hope, Andrew, you see a variety of perspectives, like take the police reform bill. You've heard here from people with concerns, like Sheriff Justin Smith last week and, and Sheriff John Cook, and you've heard from proponents like Rhonda Fields and Leslie Harrod out of the legislature. I hope you hear a lot of views, and I hope that you don't like some of them. Uh, Jill says, I've quit watching other news programs. Love the heartfelt opinions as well. Helen, Helen has an idea. Helen wants us to bring back the most Colorado thing, the stupid signs, the parking. Are we ready for those segments again? We set them aside with the pandemic. Is it time? Want to hear from you. See you next time.